Hello. Welcome to Salomari Speaks, Episode 1. Railroads, Sandboxes, Rocket Launchers, and the Social Contract. I uh, want to talk about how Game Masters create and run uh, adventures and the differences. We talk about railroads and sandboxes a lot, and I want to discuss what that really means and how we really do it when we run a sandbox game. I'm not a fan of railroads. Um, most old schoolers aren't. So if you're, you know, you might be an outlier if you're an old schooler and you do like railroads, that's your thing. Um, let me define this. A railroad is an adventure or an adventure series which has a number of planned encounters or set events that the player characters have to witness or participate in as they go along. In a computer RPG, these be, some of these would be cutscenes. They would be things that would be there to propel the game forward. In a computer RPG, you're usually stuck with that railroad anyway. Only the most elaborate and expansive of these games can accommodate anything resembling a sandbox. Um, hallmarks of railroads include admonitions in the printed materials if you're actually following someone's, you know, published adventure. Admonitions telling you that this encounter must go a certain way or the characters must go from here to here to here uh, and so forth. And uh, we often joke about how it happens when the characters begin an adventure, immediately identify the big bad guy, big bad evil guy, BBEG, that's supposed to be at the very end of the, of the series, they immediately identify him, her, it, them, whatever, at the very beginning, and instead of going through all this other adventure, they just go and kill him. Uh, or otherwise defeat or defuse, whatever the point of the adventure is, leaving the Game Master with all this material in hand that's not going to ever get used. And that's, that's just a, a risk of that. I recall a published adventure uh, from years past, I think, back in the first edition era, that actually had a scene where the characters were supposed to run from an army, and if they didn't take the army seriously, the Game Master was instructed to keep pouring more opponents out of the woodwork at the adventurers until they gave up and ran away. Um, this doesn't set well with me. More importantly, I'm Game Master, almost always. More importantly, this doesn't sell well with players. Players don't like this. Players don't like to be railroaded. When players realize that they're going to be forced to go in these ways, and they're going to be forced to follow the adventure in a certain course, they begin to get rebellious or resentful or just plain irritated, um, and your game begins to fall apart. Your job, and I'm going to touch on this more later, your job as a game master is to make sure everyone's having a good time. If they're not having a good time, then you're doing something wrong. Maybe. Some people are never going to have a good time. But, you know, in general, if your party is not having a good time, there's something wrong with your game. With the adventure you're running, the adventure you've written, or the direction you've taken things. A sandbox is the theoretical model of a open world where the player characters can go anywhere they want to, attempt anything that they want to attempt, um, where at the beginning of the game, in theory, the party meets in the inevitable tavern, uh, gets together to go out and be murder hobos, and <clears throat> picks from a series of adventure hooks or concepts uh, that the game master has presented. The key problem with the true sandbox is the vast amount of material you need. If you have a typical typical RPG world, seem to be seem to be um, con small continents, they're roughly the size of Australia or maybe the continental U.S. Something like that, um, big enough to have plenty of room to move around. Uh, sometimes there's islands that that agree that mass up to that. I've got one friend whose world is is four island continents that are kind of arranged around a central sea. Um, there, if your countries are the size of European countries, especially medieval European countries, 
you're going to have a lot, a lot of countries. You're going to have a lot of um, uh, history, potentially, that you may want to know. You're going to have a lot of customs you're going to want to keep track of. I'm going to talk about more about that in my next episode. Um, but the key situation, even if you gloss over the history and culture and you just say this is kind of like Germany and that's kind of like England, this is kind of like Spain, this is kind of like Italy, over here this is a pretty cool place, it's kind of like Morocco, you do something like that, you kind of gloss over all those details, you still need adventures. The players need to be able to choose from a number of potential dungeon or wilderness adventures that they could go on um, and you need to give them hooks for at least a few of those to start with. Um, but that's a lot of material to prepare. But players like sandboxes. Players like being able to do more or less what they want. They like to be, be able to feel like they're in control of their destinies. <clears throat> and that brings me to the next part of my, of my discussion. This is how we really do it. This is how sandboxes mostly really work. I am a model rocketeer. I have built and flown rockets since I was a little kid. This is my 38 year old, give or take a year, Estes Alpha. Uh, it's a very classic model. Uh, anybody who's flown rockets should know what an Alpha looks like. The key thing about a model rocket, and they're pretty much all this way, although there's some variations in exactly how they appear, but the key thing is the rocket is stabilized by its fins. Wind blowing over the fins redirects the rocket. If the rocket gets knocked off, the wind straightens it. Just how it works. But the problem with this is that when a rocket launches, when the motor ignites, the rocket is moving exactly zero. There is no wind to speak of, certainly no wind of passage, which is what we need to make the rocket fly straight. So the rocket is quite possibly not going to fly straight. Um, fireworks rockets or sky rockets or so forth, um, that's an issue with them. They typically have really large fins to compensate for the fact that coming right off the ground, they, uh, they may not be stable, uh, and even so, they oftentimes arc off at, at strange angles because they got, got a sideways kick when they took off. But model rocketeers, we really want our rockets to fly straight. So, in order to uh, keep the rocket going straight long enough to accelerate to a speed where the fins will do their job, we need to guide the rocket for a little bit. And that involves a rocket launcher. This is one of mine. The rocket rides a rod, bigger rockets may ride a rail, up, okay, I'm having trouble with that, there we go, rides the, the, the rod up as it accelerates. The rod keeps the rocket going more or less straight in the direction you've got it pointed. Um, for safety reasons, we never point them horizontal, but the important point is it keeps it going straight until it's going fast enough to get off the rod and fly correctly. This is relevant. A typical old school published adventure will have a bit at the beginning. We may call it the hook, we may call it something else, but an introductory bit, uh, a bit of a cutscene maybe, intended to get the party moving in the right direction. Last night I ran uh, an adventure for a reconstituted group. Uh, this is a group of, um, that has played in, in, in my Western Lands campaign world before, but we lost some players, gained some players. It was really just one veteran player from the group, the old group, plus some new ones. They started out thinking that they were going to go back and do the work, finish up the adventure that the original group started. But I sprang the Cave of the Unknown adventure from the Morgansfort, BF1 Morgansfort module, sprang that on them. The very beginning of that, a merchant comes into the tavern goes straight to the adventures and offers them money to rescue his daughter who's been kidnapped by orcs. There's my launch rod. The players took the commission. Now, obviously, if you have players who are going to be difficult, they're going to be difficult. The players took the commission, straight up the rod. They went to the scene where the um, caravan, the merchant's caravan, was attacked by the orcs. Um, as it happened, we were playing a playtest campaign, we were using some alternate classes, and we had both a ranger and a scout, two people who could, uh, who could track. 
um, there was some discussion because one of them made his tracking roll and one of them failed, leading them to argue about the right direction. But they used some good player logic and decided which tracker was probably right, got it right on the first try, followed the orcs back to their lair, the adventure was on its way. Once they got going in that direction, it was pretty much guaranteed they were going to go ahead and go through with things more or less correctly. Um, <clears throat> All of what I've just discussed is part of the social contract of being a game master. Your role as a game master is to make sure your players have a good time. There are a lot of ways to do this because there's more kinds of players than you could easily count. You need to know your players. You need to make sure your players know you. You have your preferences and you are there to have a good time too. Uh, unless you're getting paid to do it, you really are there to have a good time. Uh, and you want to see you want to see your players explore your world, you want to see your players do heroic things, fight big monsters. Um, you'd like to see a few of your monsters survive their first fight so that maybe they could come back later, but maybe that doesn't happen. I have a hard time with that personally. Uh, but you want to see these things. This is what you want to have happen. Your players come to your game, they want to be the adventurers, they want to go in and be the heroes or maybe the villains if they're that kind of player. But the point is they want to do things. They want to be able to take action. They want to feel like they have some influence in the lives of these fictional creations that they've come up with. This is all part of the social contract. Now, something I just mentioned a little bit ago. If the players hadn't taken the hook, if the players had just decided they didn't give a damn about this uh, merchant, he wasn't offering them enough money to uh, rescue his daughter, they could have done anything they wanted. It's their business what they do. I can't tell them to do that. But there's a social contract involved here. Let's assume for the moment that we're, we're running something resembling a traditional sandbox. We have several different adventure hooks possible, um, several different things that they've heard about. There's one that you're really thinking that they're going to do because, say, it's close or you've really loaded up on the uh, um, uh, rumors that it's a uh, lucrative dungeon or the monsters are easy kills or alternately the monsters are worth much glory if they can be defeated. Uh, so this is, this is what you think your players are going to do. And they do something completely different. In the previous running of the group I had last night, we started down in the JN1 Chaotic Caves area um, in the village that's presented there. Um, J.D. Neal did not name that village. Uh, so I simply took Bramasson from AA1, first adventure that we ran was actually beneath Bramasson. It has the rocket launcher effect. It's got the situation where the man runs into the tavern and says goblins have stolen his children. A lot of kidnapping goes on in this world apparently. And uh, the players went to rescue the children. Then we moved on and they started exploring this, the, the territory. Now in JN1, the location of the chaotic caves is actually not known to the players or any of the human NPCs at the beginning. So they have to search for it. They had a rough time searching. Um, I don't remember all the details, but I remember that they had some encounters that they weren't happy about and they didn't think they were getting anywhere. And the players got frustrated. And that, again, is their business. Um, I have had other player groups that would have not let go of that bone until they chewed it to pieces. but. This group decided that they were done with this nonsense, they were going to go someplace else. And they asked me, the game master, what was nearby. Well, I had already decided that they were roughly a week's journey from Morgansford, maybe a little more, more than a week if I remember right. Um, and so they decided they would go to Morgansford. So I rolled some random encounters and, and had them make the trip, and I already had Morgansford arranged and so forth. So that wasn't a problem, the materials existed. But say for the moment that you had a situation like that. You have um, several possible adventures, but you have one that you think your players are going to go for, and they pass on it completely, are not interested in doing whatever it was you had in mind. Uh, then you have a problem. Because you don't actually have those other dungeons or adventure areas detailed yet. You, they decide they want to go off to the big city. I'm going to be honest with you right now, the only map of the city of Slate Home that exists is in my head and it's not exactly detailed. Um, if my players decided to go to Slade Home and have adventures there, I would have to get on the ball and get some stuff done. One of the things as a game master that you can always do is throw some random encounters in. 
players are traveling from one place to another, you're not prepared for it, you don't have the book in hand, or you haven't written the adventure yet, or whatever, throw in enough random encounters to take up the session. Maybe some interesting encounters, some NPC encounters. Maybe they fight some bandits and end up having to chase them back to their lair and have a second big fight there when they encounter a second group of, uh, larger group of bandits that are still in the lair, or something like that. Um, keep it going. Make up an adventure on the fly if you have to to keep it going to the end of the session. Hopefully you then have a week, two weeks, a month to prepare for the next time and you can get your adventure in, in order. There have, however, been situations where I couldn't adequately prepare for an adventure that the players decided that they were going to do in the time I had available. I, I simply could install them um, in game. This is a social contract. Uh, unless your players are paying you to be a game master, which I, I hear does happen, uh, unless they're paying you to be a game master, you're doing this voluntarily. If your players put you in a position that you are simply not prepared for, it is absolutely okay to look at your players and say, seriously guys, I am not prepared for that. If you want to do that, we'll do that. But you're going to have to wait till next session, we're going to have to call this off early. They may rethink the situation. They may decide to take on the hook that you previously provided them for a, a more local adventure uh, or, you know, have a discussion with them. You don't have to reveal spoilers, and you should be careful not to, but let them know if you must. Let them know that they can't proceed further without giving you time to prepare. That's all you have to do. This is a social contract. The same thing applies if you're running a, an, an adventure and there's a good reason why the players really need to go forward. Rather than forcing them onto the railroad, tell them as a group, listen, and this, this is less an issue with the party wanting to go a different direction as with the party wanting to split up. This is one where I really recommend doing this. Say you have a party and the and some members want to go one way, some members want to go another way, and they decide they want to split up, and you say, seriously, seriously guys, if this is what you want to do, half of you guys just need to go home now, and I'll play with the other group. I can't run two groups at one time. I can't do it. Because most of the time, you can't. As a game master, it's too hard. It's hard enough in a dungeon if they just go down two different corridors at the same time, but you can get through that. But if you've got one group that wants to stay in Morgan's Fort and go to the old island fortress, and the other group wants to go to Slate Home, which means a long travel with a bunch of random encounters. It's guaranteed, if you try to do this at the same time, half of your party, half of your player group is sitting there twiddling their thumbs, or playing on their phones, which is kind of the same thing, and not participating. There's no way they can participate because they're in the other group doing the other thing. In the dungeon, the split up, if it doesn't involve half the party being destroyed, because they walk into a trap or something. The split up probably won't last very long before they end up get back, getting back together, and you can deal with that. But if the party literally splits and goes in two different directions, you have to tell your players, either you have to play together, you have to figure out why these characters, players often create characters that are personally difficult. Um, characters who are, would be hard to get along with in real life. Um, who then basically say no to everything that the rest of the party says. I've had players who wanted to do that. You have to tell them, figure out a reason why this obnoxiously difficult character would agree to go along with the rest of the party. You guys figure this out. You guys make this work. It is not my job to make your party function. Because that's part of their social contract. They come to your game to play. They're promising to play nice, or they should be. Not necessarily that their player characters won't backstab each other. That's their business. If they want to have an in-party fight, that's fine. You can sit there and referee for them. That's why the game masters used to be called referees. But if they're just as players being obnoxious and difficult and want to go in different directions, it is within your rights to tell them, you sort this out. You figure this out. And when you guys figure out how you're going to keep your party together as a unit, we'll move on. And then you pick your phone up and play with it for a while while they figure it out. The social contract's important on both sides. Game masters come to run a game. Players come to play. If either side isn't playing fair on this contract, the other side is perfectly within their rights to say no, walk away, 
um, or negotiate. I guess that's all I have for you. Um, the next episode, episode two, I haven't got a title for it yet, but I'm going to talk a little bit about how you can build a interesting, immersive setting without a lot of work, without a huge amount of paper, and without having to remember vast amounts of information. Um, I'm going to give you a guide to shortcuts on that. Um, I haven't got a title for that one yet, but I'm looking forward to doing it. Uh, so I'm going to sign off for today. Uh, talk to you all later. Bye.